This is the Big Douglas Show. It is a preview Friday. And for that, from the Washington Post, we brought on Sam Fortier. Sam, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. I uh, appreciate it. Sam, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I swear the first time we had you on the show was last year after the Beth Wilkinson stuff dropped uh, on, a, on a subject nobody really likes to talk about. What do you think ends up with this Congress thing? I mean, I know it's brand new and there's not much, but... What else is there if it's all been mouth to mouth stuff between Beth and the league? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, you know, two House Democrats stepping in and saying, hey, you know, we need some clarity. We need some transparency on this investigation from the NFL. I mean, I think this is the same thing that, you know, those Silicon Valley giants uh, face when, when Congress comes calling. It's, hey, you know, we can run our ship the way we want to. We can kind of live in our little you know, worlds as much as we want. But when the government comes calling, I mean, that's, that's pretty serious business. I mean, you know, especially if you have, you know, the public support behind um, those politicians, I mean, uh, they could come in here and, and, you know, start issuing, uh, you know, start issuing some orders and, and get stuff done. So I would say that this is a pretty significant development uh, to be monitoring for this team as we go forward. For those who don't realize, Sam, this is kind of, the government is allowed to do this because of the anti trust stuff that the NFL gets, right, as part of their non-monopoly agreements and the, and the tax shelters. That, that's what allows the government to do that. Is this right? I mean, I think it's, it's uh, more than that. I think if the government wants to, you know, look into you know, certain businesses, you know, I think they, they can do that. But I'm sure, you know, certainly that, that is a part of that. Although I would certainly defer to uh, Liz Clark and Will Hobson, two of our investigative reporters who are much, well, uh, much better versed in, in some of the stuff than I am. What do the other owners uh, and people around the league feel about Dan? <laughs> uh, I think that, uh, you know, I think my best point of reference here is probably um, Big Game, uh, Mark Leibovich's book about, about ownership, because I've, I've only been covering the league for, for two years now, um, this team for two years. Um, my, my understanding is that they see him as, as, you know, maybe a pretty aggressive, litigious guy who, you know, will do what he needs to to get what he wants and that book at least you know which was i think published in 2018 certainly describes dan as, as a pretty insular figure in the league who's who's really only friend uh was jerry jones and and was you know kind of a pretty private guy i remember in the book you know he, he gets a the the author gets an interview with, with dan and he spends maybe about 10 minutes talking to him and he said you know he described him as a pretty nervous jury guy who really just cared about winning and, and cared about you know um you know getting his team to the right place obviously off the field a lot of people have said a lot of things about him, but um, uh, but but that is certainly you know my impression of him. Have they said any more about the name change and the rollout date? They they have not. I, I think uh, Jason Wright, you know, maybe before the season or just you know right after the season started, said that the name change is going to be rolled out you know next year, early next year after the season. So I would imagine um, if you're the Washington football team, you want to do that you know, maybe before the draft or around the draft, you know, sometime that, that's going to have some good associative hype with it. Obviously, uh, this has been a pretty bad news beat for the last couple of years, especially, uh, uh, you know, with the name change, with the harassment allegations, with the emails leaking out now. I mean, it's really been kind of a one thing after another for this team for, you know, some could argue for 20 years, but certainly specifically in the last two. So uh, I think, um, you know, you'll probably see them try to time it um, with, with some good press because, but, I mean, we don't know if that's going to happen, right? Because the Sean Taylor thing, to me, was them trying to release it at the right time, at the perfect moment. And I just don't think they found one. And, and then, it, you know, the clock ran out. It's, it's just incredible how they tried so hard to do something right. And I'll take them for their word that that wasn't some kind of sham hurry-up deal. It still, it uh, was egregious in nature. What's going on with the training staff? And how does that affect, I mean... Obviously, there's a lot of things you can't say. It's a DEA investigation. But how does it affect the team? I mean, we've got injuries now. Someone's got to take care of them. Um, what, what's going on there with that now? 
Yeah, we're, we're waiting uh, for the DEA and, and, you know, that investigation to play out. Uh, Ron Rivera actually spoke, I, th- I believe it was last week, last Friday, uh, about, you know, kind of his frustration. You know, they don't know what's going on, he says. Um, you know, they haven't gotten a lot of clarification for any timeline uh, from the DEA. Obviously, the DEA does not work on, <laughs> on a football coach's schedule. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the few entities uh, probably that is around this park that does not. Um, but... Certainly, I mean, that, that's something going forward that they've had to really contend with. You know, they, they lost uh, Doug tra- uh, assistant trainer Doug Kwan as well. So him and Ryan Vermillion, the head athletic trainer, are both on an administrative leave. So they've brought in a couple interns, Ron said, from, from the past. You know, they're trying to piecemeal it through. But I mean, when you have injury reports as long as this team does every week, you know, uh, you know you're talking 11, 12 players. Obviously, I think they have uh, seven questionable or ruled out for green bay but when you have you know the injury room feel like that it's certainly a challenge and to not have your head guy is is certainly a logistical challenge um so i mean that's that's been uh you know definitely a thing logistically that this team has had to contend with as well let's talk about some of those injuries it's an ankle for cosme mm-hmm. do we have any idea what the situation is with them the timeline do we have anything yeah, so so as far as we understand, you know, it's it's not a serious injury. You know, it was a, more of a sprain, I believe it was described as. So that that's something that uh, you know is probably going to be week to week. He he's not been at practice for the last two weeks, so uh, I'm always going to be skeptical until we see him on the field. You know what I mean? Um, that that he'll be back, you know, next week or the week after. You know, I, I don't know what this timeline is. I think it's that's a true week to week thing. Um, and I know fans don't want to hear it, but I think the same is true with Curtis Samuel and that groin injury. I mean, this is something that. Uh, has obviously May, been the mayor of the side field. <laughs> yes, I saw that. Uh, you know, some people were joking about renaming it after him. Um, but I mean, that's uh, you know, I, I think those two uh, are, and Brandon Sheriff as well with that knee. I mean, as far as we understand, that's a, those are true week to week injuries. Okay, I, I'm curious with uh, the the quarterback stuff. Ron said they're not interested in Tua. I had been told. Uh, by somebody in the league that Watson has court case in January and can't see how anybody would touch him with draft picks and tell them this is not, I mean, Benjamin Albright comes out and says, no, he actually heard that Washington is interested. I know you guys and and some of the other local guys have said, no, that's not true. We can put two of the bed, right? Yeah. As far as I know, you know, what I was told from, you know, from people that I trust, I mean, they, they're not interested in Tua. They haven't had contact with Houston or Miami. But they know that getting quarterback right is important. Or do they plan, as I've kind of speculated, that they've pivoted here and while everybody is going, you know, young draft pick and rebuild that way, that he's done that once before. And I'm convinced Ron's happy with putting, building the team and putting in a vet, say a Matt Ryan next year, a la the Tom Brady route. Do you think that's what they're doing? Or are they they excited about the idea of of a young draft pick to pair with a brand new name? I think that it, it's really going to depend on kind of how the markets shake out. Um, I think there's a long time between now and March, the start of free agency. And, um, you know, if, if a guy like Matt Ryan came available, I'm sure they'd do their due diligence. If, you know, one of those guys, Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson shook loose, I'm sure they'd, they'd investigate that as well. But I think the thing that people miss is, is Zach Wilson didn't become the number two overall pick until like February last okay. year. And, and, and so, you know, if, if they, you know, Malik Willis or Matt Corral, whoever these guys I, I've heard the names of, I haven't honestly done like too much digging on them because so much can change between now and, and uh, now in the draft. I mean, look, look at the Spencer Rattler kid who was supposed to be the number one pick this year. And now he's in the transfer portal. So, um, I mean, it's, it's too early to tell. I think that they'll look for the best quarterback possible, whether that's a veteran, whether that's a rookie. Um, I just think it's really too early to tell right now. I've been trying to get to the bottom of this, so we'll see what we can get from you on this. It, the, the defense is not where anybody expected it to be. And I'm curious how much of last year's team was a Jack Del Rio team and not a Ron Rivera team. Because we obviously know that Ron was spending a lot of time battling cancer. And, you know, we're glad that he's over with that. Is this year because this is more Ron Rivera and less Jack Del Rio, or is it just a lot of new pieces that haven't blended together yet? I don't know if I would call last year's team a Jack Del Rio team, particularly because Ron, you know, being the one voice of the organization when he was hired, really put his fingerprints on on everything. You know, I mean, Jack certainly stepped in when when Ron was sick, but uh, I think Ron's 
fingerprints and influence was was all over not only the roster construction but but the team on the field um certainly this year has not performed up to expectations and i think um ron has said you know he he said on monday hey i haven't been doing maybe the things that that i've you know should be doing or i need to change some of my responses and you saw him you know proactively address concerns on this team um you know, immediately this week by challenging Landon Collins and shifting him from, from safety to linebacker, though he would call that semantics, those labels and, and, and cutting kicker Dustin Hopkins. So um, certainly he, he's sending a message to the team. I actually asked him today, do you think the team has received the message? And he said, you know, everybody's seen what's going on. So I, I think, you know, I would hope so. Um, so he's obviously becoming more proactive. Um, and I think that just, uh, I asked Chris Harris today, you know, why defensive backs coach, why he thought, his unit hasn't been playing up to expectations. And, and he said, basically, you know, this is the second year in the scheme, but he th- he said there were five new defensive backs. And, and by that, you know, he was talking about um, Benjamin St. Juice, William Jackson, the third, and he called, you know, Kendall Fuller, even though he played some nickel, some outside, you know, going into nickel, he said was, was a new position for him. So he, he really, I think, blamed those secondary struggles on inexperience. He said that these struggles remind him of the struggles from early last year and that they'll, he has no doubt they'll get it figured out. What has Reeves done to be stuck on the practice squad? That really was when that defense got to humming last year. Not, not that he's an all pro. I'm not suggesting that, but is Bobby McCain so much appreciably better than Reeves that Reeves can't get on the field when we saw what he and Pearl did together last year? That's certainly what their decisions are telling you, whether that's Jack Del Rio or or Chris Harris, those guys are saying Bobby McCain is appreciably better. Um, because if you look at it, I mean, DeShazer Everett, an, another, you know, band-aid layer last year, like he hasn't gotten on the field either. So they're saying, even though this defense isn't working, these are the best pieces we got. And these are the guys we got to play. I, I think, you know, asking those questions are, are totally legitimate. And those are things I've wondered myself, you know, why, if, if these guys aren't working together, can't you try someone else? And I think the, the clear answer is they really believe to their detriment or to their, you know, inevitable success in which case they can point back and say oh well we were smarter than you we were in the building every day we saw the things that you didn't which you know i mean feel free to say that if you start playing up to expectations but until the expectations happen the questions will come and i think those are fair fine line on coaching arrogance right i mean i understand that you're smart but if you overthink yourself and and again i I like chris harris and i know the league does too i mean I, i know he's up for dc jobs if and when you know, they become available, but they've got these guys playing five, six yards off the ball on a corner when there's three yards to get. I mean, I don't, it feels like that's happened for years here. And if I can see it, I'm just not sure how they don't see it. It seems like it happens all the time. Yeah. I think those frustrations are, are really understandable as well. And, and, you know, last year when this team was making fourth down stops in the red zone, when you're, you know, when you're allowing a few big plays, but you're not allowing very many, like, you know, medium sized plays uh, and you're kind of really, you know, siloing those two things and saying, okay, you know, you're going to beat us sometimes, but we're going to beat you more of the time um, and let our offense get, get enough. Um, you get the benefit of the doubt. And, and when you're not, when you're losing, you don't. And so um, I think, that you know those criticisms especially the soft zone coverage on third and short it, it's confusing I think, I think to everyone um jack del rio is is not someone who would ever expound on on anything like that in a press conference um as as anyone knows who, who has watched them um so i mean we don't have a lot of clarity there but basically uh he is asking you to trust him uh and, and whether you do or not i think is is a personal decision if the defense stays this way, will Jack Del Rio be the defensive coordinator next year? If they remain this way, if they're 32nd against the pass in DVOA, if they rank at the bottom of the league in, in every statistical measure, advanced, traditional, I mean, no, I would imagine not. I mean, I don't think anyone in this building, Ron Rivera, Dan Snyder, you know, any of the players, I don't think anyone thinks that this performance is acceptable. Um, and I think that, you know, that would be reflected. We won't spend the whole podcast beating on the defense. Let's let's talk about something nice and unexpected. The offensive line's been really good. I mean, I really had expected when uh, when you jettison Morgan Moses and you start a rookie right tackle, and let's face it, Sheriff is hurt a bunch recently. It would have been easy to see the backup quarterback just steadily having to be drug up off the ground. They've played really 
really well when you consider it. And, and I'd suggest that the organization hasn't been like lucky in a lot of ways. They've been lucky with offensive line coaches to go from Callahan to Matsko. Pretty fortunate. Had the players noticed the coaching? Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, I've talked to a lot of offensive linemen, you know, particularly right guard, Schweitzer, center Chase Roulier, and, and those guys have really talked about, um, you know, Ed Matsko is a good coach. Uh, he has certain different techniques, you know. Um, he, he really likes the double, you know, the two-hand punch. Um, but I think that, you know, when you have that sort of experience of a Callahan of a Matsko, um, I think players are going to respond to that because this dude, you know, has done it, you know, he's been around the game. Um, and I think you're right. I mean, the offensive line has, has, you know, certainly been one of the strong points. I mean, they haven't, uh, allowed a ton of sacks this year. Um, and so I think that's, you know, partially a credit to, to Taylor Heineke's mobility, but also, uh, to how well the offensive line is playing. And I mean, this is a unit that hasn't not been affected by injuries, uh, Obviously, you know, you're missing uh, Cosme and Sheriff, uh, but to have two guys, you know, Schweitzer and, and Lucas, who started last year, started, you know, 14 games combined, step in and, and provide such a, a quality, um, you know, quality backups, that really speaks to the depth that they've built. They haven't even had to use fourth round picks of Deke Charles from last year, who I think, you know, still has probably a potential role in this line. And I don't know what, but, you know, maybe someday he, he does get in there. Um, and so to me, that unit is, is, as deep and as talent, you know, as talented as, um, you know, any that, that Washington has right now. Uh, I've said this often. They don't have any superstars on that offensive line. They got a lot of really solid players and solid players behind them too. There's no reason why Schweitzer should ever not be starting. And he's a starting quality guard in my mind. What does the timetable look like on Logan Thomas? Yeah. Logan Thomas, as we understand it, you know, he's on the, he's on IR with his hamstring injury. So he's eligible to return next week uh, before the Broncos game. Uh, but they have the buy right after that. So if he's not a hundred percent, I can't see them, you know, pushing the envelope uh, on that. I think they're going to um, really just, you know, let him dictate, you know, kind of his return, his return schedule. And I mean, Ron Rivera, like quarterback Ryan Fitzpatrick, similar timeline with that subluxated hip Ron said today he hasn't gotten the MRI yet that he would you know that last week he said he was going to get this week so it's Friday he hasn't gotten it Ron Rivera said so TBD on what that means Um, but I think both of those guys it's kind of a play by ear scenario because we don't really know the other thing I'm curious about both of them really but particularly with the quarterback say he gets the MRI and he's ready you know he's healthy after the bye week I mean we think like in video game terms, like, you know, let's put them right in there, but w- how, how long will it take him to get practicing before he gets his wind back enough where a coach would feel confident, not only in the hip, but that he's got the, you know, the, the wind to be our last of football game. Yeah. I think that's, you know, kind of a question they won't know until the process starts, right? Because he's 38 years old. He had a significant injury to his hip uh, that affects his mobility. That's going to, you know, that that's a real, um, that's a real detriment that he will have to overcome. And so um, that's something I think where, where you, you don't ever really know. It's, it's kind of like the Curtis growing, right? Like, you know, you can feel good. You can get out on the field. And, and if you just take, you know, one jab and, and you feel it twinge, there's nothing you can do about that. So uh, I would imagine he'll need a week or so, maybe two of practice to get back. But I mean, that's just my speculation. And, and I, that's not informed. <laughs> no, I got you. Um, there's, it's the shin for Gibson. He has yet to break a hundred or at least it's been a while. I, I was talking to uh, the host of locked on Packers this week. I asked him, how does this team beat that team? And basically, you know, it's run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, and then take shots down the field, uh, with a banged up secondary for green Bay. Will this be that week? I mean, uh, are they, are they going to really rely on the run game in a way that I think fans want and that maybe they haven't done? Yeah, I think it's always tough uh, because, you know, you want to talk about game flow stuff a lot as well, because, I mean, in early games this year, they would get down by two touchdowns and they would have to, you know, maybe turn it up with the pass or, you know, they haven't been able, because their defense has been so porous, they haven't been able to really commit to that ground game, I think, in a, in a way they would like to. I mean, uh, in week one, you know, Scott Turner, I think, really went to Antonio Gibson a lot. And and even, I think, one of the things that, that was interesting to me is, you know, even when Antonio would break off long plays, he'd go back to Antonio right away. I mean, he was really you know, investing in Antonio, not only breaking those big plays, but also, you know, establishing the run and getting downhill. And so to me, um, it's going to be a game flow thing. If Aaron Rodgers comes out and slings three touchdown passes in the first quarter, I mean, then you don't really have a choice. You're in a shootout. But if they can, if they can dictate, if they can control, which is a big question, 
then yeah, I, I do think they want to give Antonio the ball. And, and also, um, you know, we were talking to Antonio today. He says he has no doubts that he's going to play on Sunday and um, that he left the game because the guy, you know, a guy landed on his shin last week and he said it, it just hurt too much. So, uh, but he's managing that. He says he's okay. So um, if he's there and if the situation breaks right, I, I, you know, I can't imagine why they wouldn't do that. What, uh, what, how do you see the game shaping up on Sunday? Think they have a chance in this one or are we looking at blowout city? I don't know about blowout city. I think that, that Washington's defense uh, while, in shambles probably a bit for you know lack of a better term um if if the rush can continue to progress um if the defensive backs can continue to progress in the way that chris harris said and and those are both huge ifs i should say um if if landon collins you know can can make that impact that, that linebacker um maybe they can keep this one close but i mean anytime you're going against a team led by aaron Rodgers and has you know the skilled players of Devonte Adams and Aaron Jones that's gonna be a really tough offense to to contain and I think you know maybe I'm a sucker buying into Taylor Heineke you know being a Green Bay Packers fan you know watching Brett Favre with his dad Brett growing up um his dad you know passing away 10 years ago and this being an emotional week for Taylor um I think that you know so, sometimes uh, you know you just get a vibe that, that things will that things will be close um that's for some reason why I think it'll be this week but I haven't necessarily had hit a, hit a thousand uh, on my predictions for the season. So I don't know if I would trust myself. Have you been to Lambeau before? I did. I was at the, uh, the Seahawks Packers game. Uh, I want to say it was a divisional round in, in 2020. And, and you fly out today. So uh, we wish you the best on that and uh, safe travels. He's Sam Fortier. You can find him on Twitter at Sam for T R what's uh, what's coming up in the, in the post this week. Oh, I mean, uh, this week in, in coverage, we have a lot of good stuff coming. And, and my colleague, Nikki Javala, is working on our, our Sunday special. So you really should uh, check that out. All I'm going to say is, uh, you know, notable NFL figure, Star Wars, and uh, Justin Timberlake. So definitely, you know, keep on the lookout. Right. I am intrigued. <laughs> Sam, as always, we appreciate you coming on, man. Have a safe trip out to Green Bay. Of course. Thanks, man.